clinicians are not always comfortable with this and partly it's the complexity and they wonder are they being given slightly selective evidence um, so would you like to challenge any of the things that were said is professor Vashuran still here she is somebody with particular knowledge would she like to make a comment perhaps or well, maybe she's not here oh there she is If you ask me specifically. Um, well, with diet, it's always that everything is so intertwined and there's so much interaction. So I was just wondering, uh, focusing from alcohol to wine, um, how much bias do you think there is, if you, if, especially if you look at the more population-based studies? And the other thing I find striking is that you recommend in your last recommendation the four to six glasses of wine, which is quite a lot and I think has some negative, a lot of negative implications on, on other types of chronic diseases. So that would be my two questions. Your ears are better than mine. Ah, well, I didn't quite hear the question. I, I noticed to some relief there were 70 milliliter glasses of wine. <laughs> so well, still. But, um, but, but so, the, some glasses are so containing 70 milliliters. Okay, okay. But the, question, the first question, Paul, was one of the, the possibility of bias, and there's no escaping the possibility of bias, because we, we, we went from the, the procyanidins of, of, of wine to those contained in chocolate, to oleic acid, uh, to the poly polyphenolic antioxidants in, 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 in oleic acid, and then onto the epidemiology. So there has to be some room for bias. Nevertheless, um, I think Paul attempted to, to build up a story, but you're, you're being quite gentle. Uh, would you, do you want to be stronger than that? Do you think it's all very biased? Well, I think I get a mixed message because every time you say, we well, don't think there's a, ma a magic bullet, but still in all the talks, it, I feel a bit like you present the polyphenols as the magic bullet. And, and it's politically correct to say, we don't think there's a magic bullet, but still. Well, first of all, we're not talking about the magic bullet. I didn't say that. And I agree with my confreres who say uh, you should not be looking for a magic bullet. But I'm saying only that from the data that I as a clinician see, I think that drinking um, four glasses of wine of 70 milliliters, which is around 300 milliliters, from which you can make two capsules containing 500 milligrams of polyphenols. Grosso modo, just to give you a reply. So the message is not uh, inconsistent. You either do one, and then you have the alcohol with it, or you do the other, and you don't have the alcohol. Or you do one capsule, 200, 250 milligrams, and you start eating apples. Hmm. Well, I, I think the first recommendation to have the total Mediterranean diet is still the strongest and is not just saying then, okay, if you can do that, then take your regular diet and drink the wine. I don't think that's uh, uh, the best message. Okay, you want to hear from me which of the three options is the best? No, I'm stating that I think that the <laughs> total Mediterranean diet option is the best. <laughs> oh, she, she believes that the total Mediterranean diet is the best option. Do you agree? Well, fine. Uh, I, I leave it to my patients who say I can't make a Mediterranean diet. The list that uh, Professor uh, has given was that I should have so many this and that and that. I can't obtain it because I live in Lapland. No. Okay? So, yes, if, if you want to hear what I am telling them, I told you. There are three options. I don't think okay. one is better than the other. We have no evidence for that whatsoever. But we have evidence that the Mediterranean diet works. We have evidence from the retrospective meta-analysis that vegetables and fruits do. And we have evidence that the capsules work. Yeah. So well, the capsules is then also a small part of the total wine. But Okay, thank you for your comment. And I think to recommend more than two glasses of wine, that's uh, from the cardiovascular perspective, it gives further protection. But from the cancer perspective and the, the, the total health perspective, I think two glasses would be the upper limit for men and one for women. 
I would concur with you that the alcohol factor is very important. That's we are now making a powder out of it. Okay. Well, no alcohol. One of the questions that we get asked, uh, we didn't really spend any, any length of time in the meta-analysis, and there's sort of a magic in the word meta-analysis, but I think it was more of a review than a meta-analysis, if, if I understood it, in that there are only the two major randomized trials. But one of the questions we get asked is whether we need more randomized controlled trials, and if so, what's the direction to go? Well, we had agreed that we would discuss that during the panel discussion. Um, of course, the more evidence, the better. But we are here today. I don't think of a single think of a single industry, or a single government, or a single entity that is a will it's willing to pay for such a trial. That's just as long and the short of it. I've gone to the major industries on the food side, and you only have to listen to the other stories. Maybe. That should be once more done. But they are not interested in helping you out. And the pharma industry, even less, they have statins. They are effective. Wonderful drugs. The epidemic that was going to be contained in 1980, or by 2000, oh yeah, well, still around, but that's good for us. Dr. Corder very cautiously recommended more randomized trials at the end of his talk. Would you like to elaborate? Well, my view, my view for some time has been that we can't make clear recommendations for people's long-term health without randomised trials. If you look at the history of beta-carotene supplements where it was observed that smokers had lower beta-carotene levels and therefore there was two trials, one in Europe and one in the States, giving people beta-carotene supplements to try and uh, reduce the risk of cancer. The observation was that beta-carotene supplements increase cancer incidence. So I don't really believe that we can go beyond our current understanding of what is good to reduce both cardiovascular risk and cancer risk without doing randomised trials, firstly to establish what the, a good composition of these dietary polyphenols would be and then to look at the long-term outcomes of those interventions. Now, clearly Mars have agreed to do this with NIH in the, in the, in the States with cocoflavanols. But is that the only preparation that could be used for this? Perhaps a grape-based polyphenol extract should be put through some randomized trials. To do that, I think we, we probably need to have one of the EU funding streams that would support this type of initiative. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Well, I, I would personally concur with that. With questions from the floor? Yes, no, no, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, more than a question, is a comment. It's clear that if we could have a randomized controlled trial with the selective components, we would make uh, a leap forward. But this is, uh, we have to acknowledge at one point that this may be extremely difficult because these preparations are not patentable. So there is no protection from a company that wants to invest in uh, making uh, a compound, making a pill out of this, uh, not being copied by others uh, without any legal protection. So this is a, a real obstacle to uh, have funding for this kind of research. Sure. And this is where the entire field gets stuck. We have evidence from uh, these big trials with uh, the entire uh, diet, and then we have uh, in vitro animal studies with selective components that uh, point to some direction for active, potentially active compounds. But then we would like to close the circle to reproduce the findings of uh, the large trials with the diet as a whole with the selective components or a mixture of components, but this turns out to be almost impossible to do. And I think doctors will have to live at one point with uh, this difficulty if, uh, uh, if the field doesn't move forward because of these uh, uh, patent uh, issues. 
Okay. I, I would like to add something to this, Raffaele. This audience here is at least interested in this matter. But the majority of the 33,000 people attending this meeting were not. And it's not that I want them in this hall. It's just that food and components from food and the contribution is not anything that we've had in our training. And so each time I have a contact with somebody, I said, well, how many hours of food information did you get during your training? And they say, four, six. It's really not my kind of thing. It's not my obligation. And I think cardiologists in the future would be very well served to know about these things because more and more the solutions of our things will be in the direction of, shall we say, uh, this type of nature, natural solution rather than pills. And that's a dilemma that is evident and will not be easily solved okay. until the medical schools start taking this on very seriously. There's somebody on the far side who's been waiting two people for a, quite a long time, and then we'll come back to the middle, please. Uh, yes, I have uh, two questions, or all three. I am I, I, I'm not a scientist in this field, so these are almost layman questions. So the first question is about uh, latitude. Does the Mediterranean diet work across latitudes, or does it only work in the Mediterranean? And the other thing is, uh, is it a cultural thing? Does it work if you eat Mediterranean diet in your car on your way home, or do you have to sit down with your family and talk to them? And the third question is about supplements. Do we have any, any evidence that supplements ever work, or, do, or, or is it only the food that works? Raffaele? I can try to ask uh, on the issue of whether the Mediterranean model is uh, uh, subject to being exported to other latitudes. Uh, there has been uh, a study many years ago called the North Karelian study in which uh, uh, people with, uh, in which the diet of uh, um, a southern Mediterranean uh, villages was exported to the region of uh, Europe with the highest uh, rate of heart disease which is uh, northeastern Finland and uh, the reverse was done also. And uh, there was, it, this was not an outcome study because it was impossible to do, but uh, there were measurements of surrogate markers, a lot of surrogate markers, and they all pointed out in the direction of uh, favorable changes when you try to implement uh, the dietary, the southern Mediterranean part, dietary pattern in uh, northern Europe and the reverse. So uh, it's not conclusive, but I think it's uh, quite uh, uh, pointing to the fact that you can export this model, even removing it from the, let's say, the environment, the, the, the ability to sit down uh, at the table at lunchtime, which is, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, impossible also now in southern Italy. Okay. And another question from the far side, please, because they've both been waiting. Hi, thanks. So it's an interesting point that you guys made about um, the big kind of industries not being interested in these randomized controlled trials and them being extremely expensive. And then we have the uh, massive limitations on epidemiological studies. So that kind of leaves us with the question of where we should start. So with nutrition undoubtedly being an important part of biology, and the guiding principle of biology being evolution via natural selection, it, doesn't it not make the sense to at least take an evolutionary perspective on all of this in terms of our diet paradigms and just use it as a place to start rather than trying to isolate specific components or yeah, trying to extrapolate from these limited studies? Roger, do you want to take that on? Well, I, I think... I mean, I understand what you're saying, but, you know, a lot of diets don't have outcome data to support their benefit apart from the Mediterranean diet. But if, if we tease out some of the factors that are critical in, in a Mediterranean diet, it may be that just increasing olive oil consumption over saturated fat may be a, a factor in some people in improving their, their well-being. Um, consuming monounsaturated fats 
tends to raise HDL and reduce LDL cholesterol. So that alone may be beneficial in, in some, some people. Um, the Mediterranean diet is typically low in sugar. Reducing sugar consumption to the level of the Mediterranean diet is likely be, to be beneficial to pretty much everybody. And so it's those sort of messages that perhaps we should take in defining what's a healthy diet from the point of view of cardiovascular health. I, I guess my only point was, <clears throat> the chairman said at, at the front, well, people from Lapland don't have access to a Mediterranean diet. So why don't we think about, well, what did the people from Lapland used to eat when they weren't suffering from cardiovascular diseases? And I think if we put that onto various places around the world, we can start to get a picture of what used to work for that population and perhaps we should, should go back to those aspects. The, the life expectancy in some of these places was low with primitive diets, and that's maybe because other medical interventions weren't available rather than their diet, but it's very hard to extrapolate from a population where you don't have the sort of good current data about the utility of that diet in improving that group's health without the sort of uh, current uh, sort of optimal medical interventions that might be used in, such, in some groups. So it's very hard to really do good diet research and extrapolate the information from that and change people's health in a way that's beneficial. Yeah, yeah two, two in the middle, please. Uh, I have a specific question for Dr. Corder. Um, knowing that in, in red wine we have monomeric polyphenols and procyanidins, and the same in, in, in cocoa extract. Um, I'm wondering why you focus on, 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 on the procyanidins uh, knowing that also that, that the monomeric uh, polyphenols like epicatechin and catechin has been shown to be absorbed. And this can be in, in, in the site of action in the, in the uh, interact with the endothelium uh, in vivo. I, I hear what you're saying and I think this is a very much an unresolved question. I mean, a lot of the evidence is based around the PNAS paper that Schroeter published in, I think it was 2005-2006, that epicatechin could produce an endothelium dependent or f increase in flow media dilatation. But it was based on three individuals. A, a more recent study, um, actually published from Peter Holman's group in the Netherlands, showed that in 37 people, epicatechin had no effect on blood pressure or endothelial function. So I still think there are unresolved questions. In terms of in vitro effects, you cannot change endothelial function with the sort of levels of epicatechin that are present in blood. Whether you can find procyanidins or procyanidin metabolites in sufficient concentrations to cause effects on the endothelium in, in the circulation is still an unresolved question. But I, I'm really dubious that epicatechin can cause the effects that cocoa has. What we lack is the study that I've always been encouraging the cocoa groups to do, is to do an epicatechin depleted cocoa extract, which is feasible, it's been used in some studies, and see what effect that has on vascular function. That would be much more helpful in resolving this question than just saying that epicatechin has some biological activity. Thank you. Before we go to the next um, uh, question, let me repeat what I said, maybe too rapidly. From the first and the second and of this symposium, we have tapes, videotapes, and edited questions, and they will come available. So for all those enthusiasts who are still wanting to hear the real truth, if you want to go back a little bit, this is all on videotape, free, on behalf of the European Society. Sir. Um, thank you. I, I've got a, a couple of observations uh, and then a question. And my observations are this. I've really enjoyed the presentations. Thank you very much indeed. It was really interesting and really also interesting to pick up some of the passion, particularly about the role of nutrition in prevention of cardiovascular disease. As you can be reassured that this morning's uh, um, seminar on nutrition, which I, I had the privilege of speaking at, was actually really well attended. It was completely packed out. And that was on the Mediterranean diet and other, other dietary aspects. So you can be reassured about that. Um, I, I'm, slightly, um, I'm slightly disheartened because despite feeling the passion for, for diet and nutrition, 
I, I then start hearing about trialing uh, uh, various um, supplements and seeing if supplements work. Uh, and I would ask the question, isn't that just, isn't that going backwards? Don't we have the PREDIMED study now, which gives us good, elegant, robust evidence that actually it is the whole diet that matters probably. It's probably the interaction between foods, which is why supplements frequently fail to show any benefits, I suspect, in these trials. And I would, I, would, I would argue with your point that your suggestion is that we can't persuade people to adopt a more Mediterranean diet. And the reason why is because the evidence over the last 10 years is that the countries that are adopting a more Mediterranean diet are places like the United Kingdom. If you track the evidence of adherence to the Mediterranean diet, actually it's many of the countries in Northwestern Europe that actually are now beginning to move closer to, the, to a Mediterranean diet. They've got a long way to go, but it's places like Greece and Italy that actually are most rapidly moving away from that pattern of eating. So I would suggest that, at least in your practice, perhaps uh, in the Netherlands, or at least in this part of the UK, uh, of this part of the world, and br more broadly, we should be promoting the PREDIMED um, study, the Mediterranean diet, and not getting bogged down in trying to uh, manufacture supplements um, for which the evidence may or may not uh, prove the case. Can, can I respond to that? I mean, my, my thank you, Simon, for your helpful remarks, but I think that it's about saying the Mediterranean diet is good, but can we make it better with supplements? Not about the supplements are really the alternative to the Mediterranean diet. In terms of Sardinian longevity, in Neuro province in Sardinia, a lot of the supercentenarians were so far from the coast they never ate fish. Their, their diet wasn't a typical Mediterranean <laughs> diet. They might have had olive oil in their diet, but a lot of their other dietary habits were not typical Mediterranean diets. So there may be uh, factors that we should consider when thinking about supplements that will help improve the success of the Mediterranean diet. You have been faithful in the back of the room. You have now the microphone. Could you move to a microphone? Oh, no question. Okay. He's the party. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's observing. Well, then you have the last word. <laughs> well, those of you, you can't see as I can. The Professor Hulaholz's tie has glasses of wine on it, some of them full and some of them empty. So he obviously believes passionately in what he's been, been telling you. Uh, I found it a great session. I, I think there was, in the end, a, a, a very good degree of balance that nobody here wants to... Uh, denigrate the comprehensive total approach to nutrition and I think even Professor Hugenholz with his passion for the supplements would see them as an adjunct rather than a 100% alternative so we thank you very sincerely for your attention and your very interesting comments thank you